Hello, welcome to Animated Literacy. My name is Jim Stone, and I am the author and creator of Animated Literacy, which is a beginning reading and writing program that takes children from the earliest stages of written language to fluency and independence in reading and writing. In this YouTube series, I'm going to be presenting the 91 basic lessons from the story, song, and action book. So there will be a segment for each one of those lessons, and I will be teaching those lessons as closely as I can to the way that I presented them in my own classroom. This YouTube channel is titled Animated Literacy Lessons. We have another YouTube channel that is called Animated Literacy Overview and Research. So please also visit that channel and it will give you the scientific research and brain research, language research and reading research on which animated literacy is, is founded. And I believe the better you understand the research behind it, the more successful you'll be in terms of implementing the program. So in this section, what I'm going to do is just give you a preview of some of the early lessons from the story, song, and action book so that you can kind of see the sequence and how the program begins to evolve. The first thing that we're going to be doing is developing listening comprehension by reading to children and developing phonological awareness through the use of 45 animated literacy characters. Each character has a complete story, and in order to have a complete story, you have to have characters that are placed in settings that have problems to resolve, that undertake actions to resolve their problems, and at the end of the story have feelings of success or failure. So these stories can be used to teach story structure, to teach vocabulary, and to improve children's language skills. Then following the story, there's a song that goes with each character, and each song has finger plays so that children are physically involved in the singing of that song. And in the early stages of language acquisition, it's gestures that drive the meaning. And this is especially true if you're working with children who have limited language skills or, or who are just beginning to learn English as a second language. Before starting the program, I suggest putting up all of the characters in black and white, the way you see in this chart. And you can either use a chart for that, or you can use half-size picture cards, or you can use our full-size picture cards. It just depends on how much space you have up on your wall. Then as you're introducing the characters, each time you introduce a, com a character's complete story and song, you change the black and white picture to a color picture. So that way, gradually, these black and white pictures will all come into color. And as that's happening, children will be able to assess their progress by simply looking at the chart to see how many pictures are in color. And that's real valuable that children are able to see how they're progressing. Lesson number one is going to provide a rapid way of introducing sounds. And it also introduces concepts that you will use all year long. So we're going to begin with using the song, Are You Sleeping, Brother John, to set the context for introducing sounds. And then we'll begin playing with sounds through the use of the bell tones that appear in the last line. So this ends up being a real valuable tool in terms of introducing sounds. Now, occasionally a teacher will tell me, well, I don't sing very well, so how can I possibly use that program? Well, I was one of those teachers who was very reluctant to sing when I first started my teaching career. So I would take a tape recording into the classroom, play the recording, and hope the children would sing along with it. But I discovered if I didn't sing with it, they didn't either. So then I learned to play guitar. So I thought, well, if I play guitar, um, the children will sing along. And I can remember back in sixth grade where I had been teased for my singing, and that's when I quit singing, and I didn't sing again until probably my third year of teaching. Finally, after two years of trying to get my kids to sing without me singing, I realized I'm going to have to take the risk of singing. So then I discovered it didn't matter how well I sang, it mattered how much I smiled and how much joy I put into the singing. And if I put enough joy in, the children would join me. This is a wonderful quote from Don Campbell in his book, The Mozart Effect for Children. And so if you're reluctant or self not very confident in your singing ability, keep in mind this quote. He tells us it is not necessary to be a professional musician or even to sing on key all the time to introduce music into your child's life. 
Young children learn most effectively from those who love them, not who, those who display the most technical skill. So if you can sing in the shower, or you can sing along with Forever Jaca in, in the car, um, you can do this. So we're going to start out with Forever Jaca. And when we first introduce Forever Jaca, I'll simply have the kids listen to it and then sing along with the recording. So this is our recording of Are You Sleeping, Brother John? Are you sleeping? Are you sleeping, Brother John? Brother John, morning bells are ringing, morning bells are ringing. So when you're first introducing Ferrero Jaca, that's all you need is the tape. It goes on to other adaptations that you can use later in the school year. So now, once we have learned to sing Are You Sleeping, we're going to put some, some gestures with it. So show me this and sing back to me. Are you sleeping? Are you sleeping? Show me brother. Brother John, brother John. Now show me your morning bells. So show me ringing a bell. Morning bells are ringing, morning bells are ringing, ding dong, ding, ding dong, ding. Now I tell the children, we're going to give you a special bell sound to wake you up each day. So here's Oscar. And I bring Oscar up to the front of the classroom and I tell him, Oscar, your name starts just like Dr. Ali Ostrich. And if you go to the doctor with a sore throat, what's that doctor going to do? He's going to put a stick in your mouth and what he's going to ask you, is he going to ask you to say? Ah! So everybody take that stick, point to your mouth and go, ah! Now sing this back to me. Are you at the doctor's? Are you at the doctor's? Brother Oscar, brother Oscar, Oscar's bells are saying, Oscar's bells are saying, ah, ah, ah. Ah, ah, ah. So what's our sound for Oscar? Ah. Now Amy comes up to the front of the classroom. And I go, Amy, your name starts just like Abe. And what is Abe doing in our picture? Here's Abe skating to the bay. And so Amy, your name starts just like Abe. For Abe, I want you to show me the wheel of a skate with this hand. Put your other hand up on top. And as you go down the hill, go, Hey! Now what's going to happen when we put Amy into Are You Sleeping? Ready? Are you skating? Are you skating? Sister Amy, Sister Amy, Amy's bells are saying, Amy's bells are saying, A, 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 A. So what's our sound for Amy? Hey! What was our sound for Oscar? Ah, so right away, kids have been exposed to, and in many cases learned, to vowel sounds. Now, the reason I started with vowels, animated literacy teaches in a sequence that is just like the sequence that is used all over the world in every single language when babies are first learning to speak. And we know that the brain uses the same brain structures for reading as it does for speaking. And when you analyze speech, you find that it has the same elements as are necessary to be able to read and write successfully. So before birth, children are hearing rhythm and melody and sing-songy language, just like we're using with Forever Jaca. Immediately after birth, they start to gesture and they copy the gestures of the adults around them. If you stick out your tongue to a baby, they'll stick out their tongue. Um, and this is how babies learn to understand your emotions and your feelings is by copying your gestures. Th they also, learn language first through gesturing, not through speaking. So they learn to interpret your gestures. Then after they have been communicating with gestures for a couple months, they start to produce their first vowel sounds. And the first vowel sounds they produce all over the world are oo, e, and ah. So that's why we did vowels first so, and why I called up my children whose names begin with a vowel before I called up children whose names begin with a consonant. Consonant sounds come in later. Now, most reading programs reverse this and either ignore vowels altogether or introduce consonants ahead of vowels. 
So, but when it comes to vowels, it gets a little bit more complex when you look at what babies are doing with language. So here we have Paul. Paul comes up to the front of the classroom and I go, Paul, your name starts just like Polly Panda. And so here's Polly Panda. And what is Polly Panda carrying? She's carrying her paintbrush and her bucket of paint as she's par parachuting down to Penelope's Prim and Proper Preschool. So Polly Panda likes to paint in school. So let's pretend like we're painting. Put our paper in front of us. Move your paintbrush up and down and go. P. So how would Paul's verse sound? Show me painting. Are you painting? Are you painting? Brother Paul, brother Paul. Paul's bells are saying, Paul's bells are saying. Ping pong, ping, ping pong, ping. Now, how did I change that? I've tried, I'm trying to mimic exactly the stages that children go through in their language development. When babies are producing vowels, they do them one at a time. And then we often call that the cooing stage of language development. And that happens for most children at about two to four months old. Then it takes several months before they start to produce their first consonants. And when they produce their first consonants, the instead of of producing them like they did with their vowels. They take the consonant, put it in front of a vowel and blend the two together. So blending is a critical skill for learning to speak. It's also a critical skill for learning to read. So now we're starting to move on to blending through the way animated literacy is introducing those sounds. So let's say Tina is the next child I call up to the front of the classroom. And I go, Tina, your name starts just like Timmy Tiger. And Timmy Tiger's tickling Terrible Tom's tummy. So take both hands, tickle your tummy like this and go T for Timmy, for a Tina sound or for Timmy Tiger sound. So now let's see what would happen when we put Tina into our song. Are you tickling, are you tickling? Sister Tina, Sister Tina, Tina's bells are saying, Tina's bells are saying, ting tong. Ting, ting, tong, ting. So what was our sound for Oscar? Ah, and what did his bells say? Ah, ah, ah. And what was our sound for Tina? T, and what did her bells say? Ting, tong, ting. And what was our sound for, pa, for Paul? P, painting, and what did his bells say? Ping, pong, ping. So now very rapidly we can introduce the sound that each child's name begins with in the classroom. But remembering, we're not worrying about how they spell it. We're only worrying about sounds, not letters or spelling yet. Then gradually we move on to using the characters' names instead of the children's names. So now instead of singing, are you painting Brother Paul? We're singing, are you painting Polly Panda? And now we can begin to cre create a verse for each child and you'll see that in lesson number one. We know that emotion is the driving force behind attention. And you can't learn anything if you don't pay attention to it. And children love the silliness of playing with all of those different bell sounds. So they're going ming mong ming, king kong king, and ring rong ring, and ding dong ding. And then they're starting to do it with animals. So now we do things like this. Little puppy, he says woof, woof, woof. Polly's puppy, he says poof, so we're going to do a lot of playing with sounds and we're going to put that with rhythm and melody so that children can join in and have a great time with it. And what I'm looking for is that children's eyes are dancing. Now, we didn't do this leading into it, but you can combine literature to this. And I have taken and combined literature from an app called Skybrary. Because at the front of every lesson, when I'm introducing, are you sleeping? We want to talk about sleeping. When I'm introducing painting, we want to talk about painting. And so Skybrary is an app that you can subscribe to for only $5 a month or $40 a year. And I don't have any association with Skybrary other than to recommend it. But finding books and purchasing books for every character is pretty expensive. So you want to have some books that are tangible physical books. But through the use of Skybrary, you can also have a complete library of books that you can read with your children. And in this one, this little girl, 
um, is sleeping and it tells us that if she spins a globe while she's sleeping, somebody on the other side of the world is dancing, somebody's walking, somebody's eating, and all these other activities. Then in this book, Mole has been asleep and hibernating and, and so has his friend Bear. And he wants to get Bear to wake up from hibernation and Bear's having a hard time waking up. So that's a good book to read leading into it. Now, once we have done a verse for every child in the classroom, we can do this worksheet where every child has a page that they can do. And so here's, here's Emma's page for Are You Sleeping? And so to scaffold this, I've written Sister Emma in advance. So all she has to do initially is rainbow right over those two words by taking out her crayons and tracing it with different colors. Then she tries to duplicate that by copying those words down underneath. So while Emma's doing her rainbow writing and her tracing, I'm going around each child and showing them on the bottom line how they spell their name. Then they're to take and draw me a picture of them sleeping, where they sleep and how they sleep. And as I'm going around to each child and writing the spelling for their sound at the bottom, I'm asking them about their picture and they're giving me a sentence. So Emma says, my bed is soft. So I'm writing that sentence and she's tracing over the top of it. So at this point, all of our learning is basically copying, but you'll see that very rapidly we move from copying to doing things independently. And copying is one of the first steps that Vygotsky talked about in scaffolding. Here's Madison's page and she's drawn her picture up at the top, but down at the bottom, I, I didn't just write M's, what did I write? Ming, mong, ming, ming, mong, ming, why? Because her sound is not a vowel, it's a consonant, so we have to blend it with our ings and ongs. And then she tells me, my bed is big. Then she draws a picture of her big bed up there at the top. And here's Michael and he says, I like my bed. Then after we have done a page like that for every child in the classroom, we can make a book of those pages. And we can put it in the classroom library so every child has a special page for their name. And here was Donovan's where he's got, are you sleeping brother Donovan? Donovan's bells are saying ding dong ding. Here's Sasha's, Sasha's bells are saying sing song sing. And they can take that out and play with it. So lesson number one is a very rapid way that we can abbreviate the character story, give a little bit of context to each sound and teach those sounds in a very rapid manner. Now beginning with lesson number two, we're going to give an entire lesson to each one of those characters. So we'll tell their complete story, teach their complete song. So the kids who were not able to pick up that sound from the initial introduction in Ferreira Jaca will have a lot more context to remember the sound with. So now we're going to start out by accessing prior knowledge. So every character lesson will follow this sequence. First thing I'm going to do is because the story takes place in school, I'll say to the kids, have you ever been to school? Well, of course they have, they're sitting in school. Or if you're at home, maybe you haven't been to school yet. So you can talk about that your school, your home is your school right now. Um, we can talk about your favorite thing to do in school. What do you know about pandas? Then we can read books to expand on that prior knowledge and provide more vocabulary. So here's some Skybrary books. This one is called Pandas, and this one will give factual information about pandas. And this is Pandas Help Out, and this is a fictional story about two pandas in school. So it kind of relates to our story about Polly Panda because of the school setting. This is a nonfiction book from Gail Gibbons that talks about the things that you need to, pr to produce art and it's called The Art Box. And this is a story about another animal who paints, only this animal is a porcupine. And this animal like gets prizes for painting. So now my kids will get the entire story of Polly Panda, complete with her, where her story takes place, what problems she has in her story, how she works to resolve those problems, and at the end, her feelings of success or failure in the story. Then finally, at the end of the lesson, children will be given a page for Polly Panda that looks like this. And on this page is her song to take home. 
and a description of her gesture. And here they can rainbow write over the letter P to practice recognizing the letter P. And then they turn their page over on the back. And on the back of their page, I want them to link their prior knowledge to, this, to the new information that I provided in the story. So I might say to them, what are some things that you like doing in school? What were things Polly Panda liked doing in school? Um, what kinds of things have you ever painted before? Um, how did you get to school? Polly Panda came to school in a parachute. So they draw me a picture of something from their life that is like Polly Panda's. Then just like I did on Are You Sleeping, I go around behind each child and I ask them to tell me about their picture. And I went when I went behind this child, she says, I like to paint. So I write that sentence and she rainbow writes over the top of it or she may trace it with a pencil instead. And then the end of the day, I ask her, can you remember what that says? And the kids generally can because their sentences are personal about them. And this was another child's back of her page where she has written, I can paint a star. And so once again, I've written it and she traces over the top. Now at first, when I'm introducing the, care, the songs for the children, we're gesturing the songs together. So here's Polly Panda's song. And we start out by making our panda eyes like this, and then we show painting, and then we show all the different things we paint on. So let me give you a little bit of her song here. So show me your panda eyes. Polly Panda, show me panda. painting So when you're first using the songs, um, I gesture it and sing it, and the kids gesture it and sing it back to me. Once they've got the gestures learned, then I can take out this book that has large print of all the songs, and I can run my finger along and have the kids gesture while I'm tracking the words, so they're learning a little bit about print. Then at a later stage, we'll duplicate an enlarged version of the song from this book. And now I can make a songbook for each child in the classroom that has large print of that, put those pages into a report cover like this, and now one period of the day, I can just simply have the children take out this book, take their reading finger and put it on the text, and I can put on the recording. And as the kids are listening to the recording, they're tracking the words. And the research on fluency says that fluency is best developed by rereading familiar material with teacher assistance. And so we're going to do a lot of, of rereading with material that looks like that. So now we've gotten a preview to two lessons. Lesson number one was for Frere Jaca, and there we had a very rapid way of starting to combine sounds, and we isolated our vowel sounds the way kids do when they're cooing, and then we blended with our consonant sounds the way they do when they're babbling. So now we're going to move on to our next character, which is Uncle Upton. And so the kids learn about an umpire who hangs upside down in his umbrella tree and umpires the baseball game. So we point up to Uncle Upton like this and go, ah, for his sound. So now we have Polly Panda painting. We have Uncle Upton up in his umbrella tree. Now, as each character is introduced, you see the chart that I showed you at the beginning has all of the spelling patterns for their sound. My kids' writing develops very rapidly because they don't have to know how to spell sounds to write words. All they have to do is know how to hear the sound because if they can hear the sound and they can match the sound to the character's picture, then they can write that sound by using either the character's letter or a letter pattern. And at this point, I'm not worried about spelling. So I tell the kids, you're learning to spell like Shakespeare did. You're learning old fashioned spelling because when Shakespeare was alive 400 years ago, he wrote his own name four different or six different ways. 
So here's some examples of how children are doing that. You saw at the beginning, my children were not writing at all yet. I was doing the writing and they were tracing over the top. Now, this is about halfway through the school year and they're doing their own writing. So here they listen for the sounds and if they don't know how to spell it, they, they find the character's picture up on the chart and they choose a way that Shakespeare might have spelled it. So you can see in this one, this child writes, I am like Polly and she spells like L-I-E-K. So she spelled the sounds right, just not the way the dictionary spells them. Then down here she writes because, B-E-E-K-U-S, and it sounds just like that. So she writes, I am like Polly because I like pink and purple and my friend Alex is with me. And here's another one where if you look at the spelling of school, you can see that these children can hear every individual sound. They can look at the chart and see how to spell those and then they can write using phonetic spelling. And here's Uncle Upton's picture where he's hanging upside down in his umbrella tree. Now the children know two sounds and with those two sounds, we can start to make words. So if we have the sound of P from lesson two and we have the sound of U from lesson three, what if you combine those two sounds, what two words can you produce? Up and pup. So here's some Skyberry books that we can read and we can talk to the kids. What do you know about a pup? Who do you know that has a pup? What do puppies like to do? And then we can read books to learn more about puppies. And here's one called The Nosy Pup. And here's a nonfiction book about puppies where they can learn some factual information about pups. I always use this book in the early stages with young children because Dr. Seuss started with the same two words that I start with. If you go to his easiest book, Hop on Pop, it starts with what? Up, pup, pup is up. Then he wrote an entire book about pups. And in this book called, called Great Day for Up, you have the word up and you have the word pup again. Now we're going to draw a picture of a pup. And my picture is going to look like this. And the kids will copy me step by step. Now, some people have expressed a concern that if you teach children to copy, maybe they won't be creative. Or, and some people have expressed another concern that says, well, I don't draw well enough to teach children how to draw. There is no substitute for the drawing component. I went from, probably from the time I was about seven years old till the time I was teaching kids how to read and write, not being able to draw anything. Then once I started to include a little bit of drawing, I saw how powerful drawing was. And I went to Mona Brooks workshops to learn how to draw. And she is the author of Drawing with Children. Mona Brooks developed all her drawing techniques working in a preschool with four-year-olds. And what she tells us is that all most artists learned by copying. Michelangelo, Picasso, all of those artists in their early stages learned how to copy those who came before them. So I'm going to show you how I draw with the children here. So first we'll take out our pen, take the cap off, put it on the other end, and show me when you're ready to draw eyes. Now my drawings are not Mona Brooks drawings, but they're using the techniques that Mona Brooks uses. And she always starts with the eyes and the face and works from the inside out. So show me when you're ready to draw eyes. Oh, I like the way your pen is up in the air. Show me two circles for eyes. So make those two circles on your page. Show me pupils. Let's put a dot inside each circle. Show me when you're ready to draw a nose. Oh, I like the way you're watching and listening. So now we're going to make a circle for the nose. Now you don't have to know a single word in English to be successful with this, but you're going to learn a lot of English from it. Show me when you're ready for a mouth. Let's make a curve this way and a curve this way. Show me when you're ready for a tongue. Let's make a curve here. Show me when you're ready for whiskers. Let's put some little dots here, some little dots on this side. Show me when you're ready for the head. Let's make a nice big circle all the way around the face. Show me when you're ready for ears. And when I say the word, I, I touch that body part so that the kids comprehend what it is that I'm saying. So let's make an ear 
from the top of the scalp down to the chin. From the top of the scalp down to the chin. Show me when you're ready for legs. Let's make a line from this ear down across the bottom of our page and up to this ear and add a line down the middle. Show me when you're ready for paws. We're going to put one, two, three here. One, two, three over here. And show me when you're ready for a tail. Now I'm going to give him a little short stubby tail, but you can give him a long skinny tail or any kind of tail you want. Now when I get this page home, I want everybody to know I drew a pup. So how will they know that? We need a word. So now is where we're going to start talking more about letter names and letter shapes. And this is where I teach printing. Everybody say, pup. What did you hear first? For painting. Well, how does Polly spell that? With a P. So how are we going to make a P? Let's make a straight line down and a curve. So I use the same vocabulary and techniques for making the letters as we used for drawing the pup. Say pup again. Pup. Ah, for up. How does Uncle Upton spell that? Most of the time he uses a U. So we'll talk about how to make the U and the kids draw a U on their page. What do you hear last? Pup. Pup. Oh, I like the way you're painting. So even though nobody's showing me painting, if this is first week of kindergarten, I still go, oh, I like the way you're showing me painting, and they all go painting. So now here, we did our pup in lowercase letters. Now we're going to give our picture a title. Many reading programs start with the word the. No child speaks the for its first word, so it's not developmentally accurate, but in order to coordinate animated literacy with other reading programs, we'll title our picture, The Pup. And we'll write THE in all capital letters, which means it's all straight lines, which the children can copy quite easily. So what does T-H-E spell? THE. Now let's write PUP with all capital letters. So there's our P that looks a lot like this one, but when we make our U, we're going to make it just as tall as we did the P. And then on the end, we'll make another P. So now the children have learned lowercase letters, capital letters. They've learned to write the pup. And now they can take the picture, put it up on top of their heads, and look around the room at everybody's pups. Now here's some examples of what my kids drew. And these were all drawn the first week of kindergarten. Well, before I show you my kids' pictures, I told you that Mona Brooks developed these techniques drawing with preschoolers. And so a preschool in Kansas that's using animated literacy sent me these pictures that their preschoolers drew of the pup. One teacher teaching special ed with only four students in her classroom told me she made t-shirts of all the four children in her classroom with four pups, one of, for each of the children. These are ones that my kindergartners drew, and these were their first time drawing with me on that first week of kindergarten. And here's some more. So you can see their pups all look different, even though they're copying me. Now, once we have finished drawing that pup, my kids are going to get a puzzle page that looks like this. And they can draw their pup again here, and then cut out the words at the bottom there that are in the wrong order. And this sentence says, the pup is up. Now they have to put that sentence back together in order. And so I'm going to be introducing a combination of high frequency words along with the drawing words. Then they take that page and they fold right above where the puzzle is, flip the page over, and now on the back that appears. So now they can copy that sentence here and draw a picture of it. Now as soon as I can, I want to move children to independence. So if I take and put some stars next to some of those words. A star, when I give my kids a puzzle, tells them to change that word. So I could put a star by pup, and I could put a star by up. And so if my kids are at a higher level, now I can say, I want you to copy the sentence, but don't use those two words. Use your own two words. So now we're moving children to higher levels of independence. And a child might write, the cat is running the um, dog is lying down. So they could put any kind of words that they want to rewrite that sentence. So now you can see here, this child 
has completed her sentence and she's copying it on the back of her page and she's drawing an illustration to go with it. Now, every time we draw something, it goes up on our drawing word wall. So when we drew our picture of up, here was an arrow with up and here was our puppy. And so we're going to then start to put these into pattern songs so the children will have a complete text to read and write. And throughout the course of the year, we're going to keep adding more and more pages to the drawing. And so this is the first page and here's another page that goes up. And so when the children are rewriting our pattern songs, their first step is to look at that chart. Now, if you're doing this in preschool, you're going to see the same progression that takes place when kids are learning to speak. Their first words are going to take some time. So you can go back and draw that pup over and over and over again and decide when they're ready to go on to another word. And th so those first 10 words may take quite a while. Maybe you don't go beyond those 10 words in a preschool, but if they're ready, you can go way beyond that. Then as once they reach 50, an explosion takes place. And so that's what this is talking about. And when you teach in a natural sequence, the way I am presenting animated literacy, where you begin by singing to children and reading from books that have rhythm and melody, and then you start putting in lots of gestures, and then you teach your vowel sounds, and then your consonants with blending, and then you move on to single words, you're gonna see the same explosions in their reading development as, as took place earlier in their language development. So now we're going to move on to a complete song. So this is a song about chasing. So here's a Skybrary book about the gingerbread man. Run, run as fast as you can. You can't catch me. I'm the gingerbread man. This is Blue Sea by Robert Cowan, where the fish, little fish is being chased by big fish and big faced fish is being chased by bigger fish who's being chased by biggest fish. This is a little more complex text that talks about various animals and what they do to survive when they're attacked from other animals. So now we're going to take and put our word that we just learned to draw into the context of a song. And the first song that we use words in for replacement in is I Caught a Fish Alive. And our version of I Caught a Fish Alive sounds like this. One, two, three, four, five. I caught a fish alive. Six, seven, eight, nine, ten. I let it go again. Why did you let it go? Because it bit my finger so. Which finger did it bite? This little finger on the back. So the kids enjoy singing along with that song and gesturing it and it starts out with a fish and then it moves on to a snake and then it moves on to a shark. But we didn't, didn't draw any of those. What did we draw? We drew a picture of a pup. So all the kids write the word pup here. Then we can go along and we can track it. And if they're at a high enough level, we can start to make a hide and seek out of it. So I'll go, okay, everybody put your finger up in the air. Now let's see if you can find where the word it is hiding. Oh, there it is. So they all put their finger on it. And now if they have learned enough sounds, I'll go, who can show me the sounds in it? It. Who can tell me the letters in it? How do we spell it? I-T. Who can find another one? Find the word go. Oh, here it is. Show me the sounds in go. G for gliding. O for rowing their boat home. What are the letters in go? G-O. So these provide a lot of really effective introduction to tracking, to high frequency words. And here's another one here. And this child has put in her word pup. Only on this one, we used the words one, two, three, four, five, instead of the numerals. Then just like we did with Are You Sleeping, we can take their finished products and we can put them into a book that looks like this and put our book into the library with all of their different versions. Then using Vygotsky, what you can do with assistance today, you can do independently tomorrow. Later in the school year, I give them their pages like this and I don't tell them what to write. They can look up at the chart, choose whatever word they want from the chart and add that to their page. So that's kind of a little bit of how the sequence goes. So let me review that. We started with lesson number one, 
where you had a very rapid way of introducing sounds. And so I'll model that entire lesson in the next segment. Then we moved to lesson number two, where they accessed prior knowledge about painting and going to school. We read books about painting and going to school. And then they learned Polly Panda's story. They learned her song and her gesture and how to play with that sound. Then they drew a picture of things, ways that they were like Polly Panda. Then we moved on to Uncle Upton and we learned that he's up in his umbrella tree and we point up to him and go, uh, and we learned his story and his song. And now we had two sounds and two letters so we could create two words, up and pup. And so we learned to draw our picture of a pup. So now we have a visual image of that pup to connect to the letters. And then we plugged it into a pattern song. So now in our next lesson, we'll learn short O for Ollie Ostrich. The kids will draw a picture of a pop and then we'll put pop into I caught a fish alive. And so we can go one, two, three, four, five, I caught a pop alive. And then we introduce M in the next one. And we have Mimi Mermaid moving her magic mop and her sound. And then for hers, the children drew pictures of a mom. And then we put it into a complete song. Lost my mom, what'll I do? So we make this into a hide and seek where mom is hiding and, and the child has to go and find her. So it keeps repeating. Every time a new sound is added, then that sound is combined with previous sounds to draw. And then that drawing is added to a pattern song that we can track and locate words in and gesture those back. So please join me for the 91 lessons and we'll keep going one at a time until finally, when we get all through 91 lessons, we will have everything that we need to read and write effectively, but we'll have to keep practicing it. So then following those 91 lessons, I'll give you some introduction to the review lessons that can be used over and over and over again. So thank you very much for joining me, and I hope to see you in the next lessons.